Hello, my name is Rosalind Love and I'm from the Department of Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic, known as ASNAC for short. And I'd like to introduce you to one of my colleagues, Maura Nirvani. Hi, Maura. Hello. Would you like to tell us which part of the course you're responsible for, the ASNAC course? Yeah, so I'm very much involved on the, with the Celtic side of the course. I teach mainly medieval Irish language and literature and also a little bit of uh, medieval Welsh and then Celtic philology, which is um, a course that kind of brings both together. And I contribute uh, a little bit to paleography and various other um, bits and pieces as well. But as I say, medieval Irish uh, language and literature is the, is the course that I coordinate. That's, <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a lot. Can you, can you give us a sense of how, how different Welsh and Irish are from each other, maybe? Yeah, I mean, they're both Celtic languages. So uh, that means that the structure of the language is similar in lots of ways. But um, if you learn medieval Welsh, it's not that you will understand medieval Irish or, or vice versa. But you, mm. might, uh, you might notice that in both languages, um, uh, interesting things happen at the beginnings of words for example they both have uh, um, things called mutations uh, you might also um, notice a little bit about the position of the verb um, you know that, that kind of thing so certainly you know the structure of the language is similar and of course also there are some words um, um, you know there are some words that um, that um, that are kind of related uh, related to one another but I suppose you know Medieval Irish and Medieval Welsh are also linked to Old English because, again, um, all of these cultures produced literatures at a relatively um, early stage. They have connections with, you know, the Scandinavian parts of the course because they had Vikings. Um, and indeed, particularly, um, particularly the literature of Medieval Ireland and um, Scandinavia. I mean, there's a huge corpus of literature um, for both of those areas. So sometimes, you know, it's possible to kind of make connections um, between um, Medieval Irish literature and Old Norse literature as well. Um, and indeed, as you well know, it's very, very possible to um, make lots and lots of links between um, Medieval Irish and indeed Welsh material and Latin, um, and Latin material, because of course, the these, uh, the scholars in these cultures were writing both in Latin and in their own vernacular, be it um, be it Irish or Welsh, um, and um, yeah, there are lots of lots of interesting uh, connections there as well. What's the what's the earliest written Irish that we've that we've got? Uh, very interesting question. Um, the in the earliest poem that people think they can date, but there are questions about mm -hmm. this date, um, it used to be Avra Holm Hiller, so an elegy for St. Columba, uh -huh. um, which was ascribed to a poet um, called the Lawn Thorgul. Um, and uh, it was meant to be written about the time of uh, Columba's, um, Columba's death at the end of the at the end of the sixth century. Mm -hmm. um, there's a relatively recent edition of this um, uh, poem, wonderful, wonderful elegy for St. Columba, which mm -hmm. shows that, um, you know, it's unlikely to have been quite as early as that. But there's a huge body of, for example, legal material, uh, which can be dated to the 7th and 8th centuries. Mm -hmm. So the Ireland, the Irish did write early. They also wrote often. Oh, there's, a, there's a large corpus of material. So, you know, 6th century, certainly there's kind of 6th century material there. It may not be the elegy of, um, of, of, of Colum Killa, but there are other there are other texts that we can that we can date to that to that period fantastic so a student starting to learn uh, Irish in Aznac what's what would they what would be the first thing that they'd be able to learn to learn to, to read what would be they'd the be first to learn text well, first and foremost, they'd be able to learn how to pronounce my name. Um, <laughs> that's um, that's a uh, you know that's I react to everything, but that's a uh, that's a uh, that's a uh, that's an interesting thing because of course my name actually encapsulates lots of lots of um lots of um uh, lots of key things like lenition and what happens after feminine nouns and all the rest oh, of it. Yes. Uh, and then we move on to um, uh, stanzas of poetry. Um, lyric poetry or personal poetry often found in the margins of manuscript wow. manuscripts but which encapsulate kind of all of human life i mean these are poems that are more than you know they're more than well they're they date back from the kind of the eighth ninth tenth centuries um but really the the kind of what they what they impart and the the emotion that they um encapsulate um are emotions that we can still kind of um we can still identify with today mm -hmm. so uh, there's quite a famous poem for example where um, a scholar is identifying with his cat, and the cat is called Pangerbon, and he's um, he's you know saying that 
there's Pangabon kind of, you know, really um, focusing on his work, which is trying to catch a mouse. And like, like Pangabon, he too is really, really focusing on his work, which is huh. trying, to, um, trying to grapple with the most difficult of texts. Or there's, again, we talked about Vikings. There's a famous um, poem, again, which um, survives just by chance on the, on the um, margin, the upper margin of a ninth century mm -hmm. manuscript which is now in, in Switzerland, is Acherin Gwyth a nacht bafos na farige fin alt. Bitter is the wind tonight, it tosses the white waved sea, and you can hear the alliteration there, bafos na farige fin alt. But then it goes on, the poet goes on to say, but actually, I'm really, really glad that the wind is so bitter tonight, because that means those Vikings can't cross the sea. And again, you can, you know, you can identify with that kind of, um, with, with that kind of, um, of feeling today. So those, those stanzas of poetry, I think, give students the kind of the flavor favor of you know early Irish society early Irish life and I suppose I acknowledge the fact that you know human nature doesn't change the kinds of things that we you know think about today are precisely the kinds of things that they were um, thinking about as well so I think that's one of the kind of the nice things that comes across um, just this you know this this feeling that you know you know that yeah human nature um, in all its kind of universality in all its variety is there um, a long time ago as well and we have evidence for it we can access it when we learn um, the languages yeah. in which these texts are written yeah um, one of the other films in this playlist, I, I've interviewed two of your uh, MPhil students who've both written dissertations on Irish literature, and it's clear that they became deeply passionate. What, what is it about the literature that, that, that hooks people in? Um, it's beauty, it's variety, it's richness, it's sophistication, mm -hmm. it's skill, um, um, all of those things. Um, you know, as I said, because there's a there's a large amount of it there. You know, it doesn't matter what your interests are, or or where you're coming from, or indeed wanting to go to. Mm. You can usually find something, something from medieval Ireland that actually, you know, that that can help you on your journey. Um, so I think certainly it's variety, but also they were so incredibly clever. These authors, <laughs> these, um, you know, these these kind of you know these these literary people. They knew mm. so much, and they yeah, and they and they and they also they had a kind of a sense of fun there's loads of texts where you can kind of you know get a sense of somebody you know um yeah just you know introducing a joke or trying to trip you up or you know and of course we as kind of modern readers probably only get um a tiny proportion tiny. of that but even that tiny proportion is really really worth it yeah would you would you share us share with us um a bit of text and read it for us and, and talk about it a little bit maybe yeah, no, I, I, what I wanted to do was uh, look at one of the voyage tales. I wanted to do that because I'm talking to you. And um, uh, we both, of course, um, uh, share an interest in this voyage um, material. Yeah. Um, I want to look at a text. Um, it's called The Voyage of Bran. Um, the, 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 the text type is called Imrov, which literally mm -hmm. means rowing around. Rowing so around, it kind of gives yes. a sense of, you know, um, a journey with a purpose, but one also, you know, where you can kind of, you know, go, go into strange um, into strange yeah. kind of areas it's a text that's earlier than the famous the most famous of voyage tales which is of course the voyage of Brendan, Brendan yeah. um, and indeed you know may have informed um, a little bit of what Brendan was doing there and I suppose the other reason I wanted um, to have a look and uh, just share this one with you is that um, this one talks as well about imaginative journeys and I wow. think um, so we'll see the piece I, the piece I want to read has um, two characters one Bran the the main character of the tale who thinks that he's um you know he's, he thinks he's sailing on a sea and then a man he meets on the sea namely um the god of the sea Mananon and Mananon says but what you see as sea that's to me it's a flowery plain so I think there's this really sense of kind of imagining and I suppose that you know being in a space is also it's also a kind of a state of mind yeah. as much as actually being in a physical um yeah. in a physical space so I just wanted to yeah. I'm going to I'm going to share a screen yeah, actually yeah, going to go bring, ahead. Go bring ahead it up on can. screen um Um, and actually, um, I wanted this, the, the text that I have here in front of you is from a fantastic website called um, Irish Sagas Online, um, oh, wow. which is from University College Cork. And they have a number of sagas there um, with the, as you can see here, with the uh -huh. um, 
Irish text on one side and the translation, um, the translation on another. Oh, so it starts. Oh, we, could put, we could put the link to that uh, uh, alongside yeah, the video. That that, be that's a really, really good idea. So Lid Bran Erev Araboroch for Mwish, Chi known for Elin. Ean Er for Snachiv known for the Diachovalt of August Kovayasov. Ora Bui, Da Law, Augusti Adhe for Sunmuir, Konaka Adoham in Ver is in Harbod Yer Sunmuir. Canadin Fer is in Chihad Ran Nile Do, Agus Slinsha Do, Agus Aspert by a Manana Maklej, Agus Aspert. We fair to doch the nating your namshiriv kiamiv, agus no gingnad mak oath, ed own mongon mak fiachne is ed forid miad. So then the following day, Bran, our hero, went upon the sea. The number of his men was chi nonver, three nines, um, and one of his foster brothers and friends was sent over was set over each of the three companies of nine. And then it goes on, when he'd been there two days and two nights, he saw a man coming towards him in a chariot. And this man, you can read the translation yourselves, this man then um, recited a song, a poem for him, which also had 30 verses. And he told him who he was, as I say, a character uh, that we also find in other tales, the god of the sea, Mananon Mach um, Lej. And then he makes a prophecy. And actually um, what transpires and what's really interesting about this tale is that the, what he actually ends up prophesying is the coming of Christ. Huh. So what we have are expectations being turned on their heads here. You think that the God of the sea, obviously, um, is going to be in a kind of a pre-Christian context, but oh. he's here, um, he ends up prophesying the, the, um, uh, the coming of Christ. But he sang then these 30 quatrains to him. And this is what I just wanted to draw to your attention, the fact that they're both um, perceiving different things. Kina Avra Lassen Ran in a Horahon Parmwing Lan Osme in Harpod the Hain Ismag Scottoch Imerjave. So Bran thinks. Bran is there in his corachon. Any of you who know anything about, um, about Irish boats might recognize the word corach, um, which is still used for a particular kind of um, boat in Ireland. So Bran in his corach, in his little corach, um, across the clear um, sea, he thinks it's a marvelous beauty. Uh, but for me, I'm in my chariot. And for me, it's a flowery plain. It's not the sea at all. Bran is actually riding on a flowery and plain, and that's where Gland only bring the brand is mag mel gonimid scoth thumse a garabad da roth. So, what's a clear sea then from this little corach in which Ambran is? I think it's a beautiful plain with masses of flowers, and that's what I see in my in my chariot of two wheels. And it goes on again, you know, continues this kind of um, comparison and just showing the different perceptions. But the different perceptions then come together um, in the end. And as I say, the whole kind of imagining and indeed just the power of description in this text, in this really, really very, very early text yeah. from uh, probably late seventh, early eighth century. So um, anyhow. I wanted so to share the voyage of Bran with you. Fantastic. It's much more vivid than than the Latin um voyage of Brendan, which is which is which is quite it 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 rattles along its story, but it doesn't it doesn't have quite that vivid description that you just shared with us. That's that's really fantastic. Thank you very much, Maura. Um I think there's many more things that we could that we could be talking about, but um I think we ought to draw draw a conclusion to our conversation for now. And uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you, you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.